Ah, so today, again, we're talking about COT Research Project. This was actually one of my medical students who's on, Dustin Leff. He's the one who, who got us connected with Dr. Ab, Al Absi. And so we're really looking forward to this. It's something that I've had students talk about, but I have not got much knowledge in. So we'll get to that in just a moment. We are going to be switching over to a new Echo platform, and that is going to be starting December 6th. So after December 6th, you will not be able to use the Zoom link and log in like you currently are. So scan this code and get it done. And just remember, if Kurt can do it, anybody can. <laughs> and that's correct. I I may have done it in a minute, 20 seconds, or else it was like six hours. You I mean, really can't recall. You mean Katie did it. Oh, Katie did it. Somebody did it. Next Next slide. Um, and again, we got some great talks coming up. Uh, we got uh, somebody next week, uh, Catherine Justice, and we have uh, Cameron Weaver coming back. He's been on this before from Hennepin. Uh, we do have one on Wednesday. There is an echo on Wednesday, November 22nd. Uh, we have a couple different things that are pending, so we'll see what, what that ends up as. Uh, but lots of great talks coming up. Um, Hennepin Healthcare, along with the other partners listed at the bottom of the screen, are going to be hosting a joint perinatal improvement summit on uh, November 16th, I believe. It got slimmed down to so, one day. Yep. And Kurt and I are both speaking at that. So if you have any interest, um, register with the QR code. Yeah, we're just a ton of fun. And so are the Hennepin people. So it should be a good time. Remember, there is free CME. Everybody knows how to get it. Just fill that thing out and get your free CME, please. I'm sure that Dr. L. Opsy would love to see your face on the on the video. So even if you're eating, don't be afraid to, to throw on that video uh, and, and show, them, show them what you look like. So, Kurt came prepared with a bag of Halloween candy I have, here. So. I have candy, I'll be eating. So <laughs> don't be bothered if you're eating. And remember? Yep. So we do offer technical assistance for any of questions you may have. Um, if you need assistance, our contact information is at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I got one of the toughest calls of all time. And I probably should have had him just call Charlie. It was pretty rough. Uh, <laughs> and maybe he had the answer. Actually, I probably should talk to him about it sometime. I haven't made a decision yet. So remember that we do have core online. It's all of the different things for uh, OUD and all of the different uh, resources. So please feel free to check that out. And that is all we have. Now, again, I'm not good at names. Uh, so Dr. Al Opsi, you may want to tell us how you say your name so I don't keep wrecking it. Uh, but we're very happy to have him on today. And we're going to have a little talk about his research with COT. So go ahead and please feel free to introduce yourself and kind of tell us a little bit about what you do. Thank you, Kurt. Actually, you did a good job. My name is Mustafa Al Opsi, just the way you said it. Wow. So congratulations. <laughs> Uh, and I'm a professor here at the university. Uh, I work out of uh, both campuses at uh, this time, um, Duluth and Minneapolis. I'm currently here in, in town, close to where you are, I think. So yeah, um, what do you want to know about me? I don't have, I can't access, by the way, that do you, would you like me to proceed? Yeah, you sure proceed. Did you want to share your own slides today? Yeah. Okay. Now it works. Okay. Sorry. Good. Yeah, I'm not good at that as well. So I tried earlier. It was not allowing me to. So yeah. So I thought what what I could use the time here for is to tell you a little bit about one of our programs. Uh, we have a, a extended program here in the cities and in Duluth that. Uh, uh, focus on substance use and trauma and stress in particular. And uh, we do work related to more in, uh, the neurobiology, if you may, and the physiology of stress and how they mediate processes related to um, uh, to addiction maintenance and relapse. That's a big one that we have. And we've been working with topics related to tobacco and cannabis and alcohol, but as a side show, many years ago, I I was approached by a colleague who was interested in pursuing uh, studying this psychostimulant cut. So uh, we initiated this project actually to do work primarily overseas. 
And uh, as time went on, you know, the project grow, grew and uh, we became uh, more engaged in activities related to this uh, CAT research project. But it remains uh, really a side show for us here locally. Um, and I'm happy to uh, talk with any one of you about what we are doing and how we can get you involved if you are interested. So let's go ahead and proceed with this project again. This um, project program was supported primarily by NIDA and Fugari International, which is the international part of NIDA, but also the International Brain Research Organization and Society for Neuroscience in Africa and our university here through the Global uh, Initiative Funding. So what is CART? Uh, I don't know if, if you were sitting in a room, I would have maybe asked some questions and saw some hands, but it's difficult on screen and for sake of kind of moving things quickly, I just uh, wanted to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the answer, I guess. Uh, so it's an amphetamine-like substance or plant. It grows in, in Africa primarily and in the Arabian Peninsula, although it's likely growing elsewhere, but people don't recognize what it is. Uh, it's used in these indigenous communities, country, country, countries where it's presence is used widely. Uh, and But it's also used quite a bit among immigrants from these countries in other parts of the world, uh, in Europe, and, North America, but also in Australia and other countries. So when we started, we didn't really know much about this uh, as far as uh, an organized fashion of data and and studies uh, at the time when we started this, which was more than a decade ago. Uh, so CAT is called multiple things, depending on the community where you come from or where you are. So it's said, people refer to it as Jima, Mira, like in Ethiopia and Kenya, Arabian tea, Somali tea, Bushman's tea, you name it, and there may be other, other names. But this is, if you hear about this, these things, maybe this one way to try to link, uh, to see whether this is related to this plant that we're talking about today. The reason why we say it's, it's uh, amphetamine-like is because it has a substance called Cathinone, it contains cathinone. This plant contains cathinones, yes, in a very tiny amount. Nevertheless, that's where it draws its um, uh, stimulant properties from that, that cathinone structure. And as you can see, chemically, it's very comparable to, to amphetamine. Um, so, uh, how the so the pattern of use basically people it's they take it like green as you saw in the earlier slide they chew on it sometimes for hours uh, and uh, the amount usually is about 100 to 300 grams in a bundle they call it a bundle but there may be other names for that and they keep chewing at it and just uh, absorb or suck out the, the juice if you made from that leaf and it is a very, very slow ascending limb, if you may. It doesn't, it doesn't like give you a fix quickly. It takes, I don't know, an hour or so until you start feeling, see more of the euphoria and the other psychopharmacological benefits or effects that you may get from it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the legal status. This is very important and relevant to people who work with, uh, who, with patients who might be using CAT. It's illegal. Not only it's illegal, but it's, it's considered one of the most illegal, I guess, scheduled one uh, uh, substance in, in the US and in, in uh, other countries. Um, but it is used legally in those countries where it's cultivated. Uh, I showed a reference there to the DEA uh, classification of cathinone as the control, a control substance. Now, cathinone is the tiny amount that we said it uh, is in the in the plant. Uh, a lot of the time, people put that plant in the same category as cathinol, which is a big thing, a big debate in, in, in terms of its legality and whether that's appropriate. It's almost like if, with, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with coca leaf versus cocaine. Cocaine as the product, the synthetic, and coca leaf as the plant. And this is kind of akin to that, except it's less 
mind altering than cocaine or or uh, even coca leaf. At any rate, it's scheduled, and there is another substance in it that's less problematic and scheduled as uh, scheduled for. Uh, okay, uh, why is it having? Does it have a, a stimulant properties? Because it basically acts on the same neurochemical pathway that that amphetamine works on. So without going into details on that, let's talk a little bit about the psychopharmacology. So you get to start chewing on it. Initially, let's say within an hour, you start feeling this euphoria, this elation, this hyperactivation, if you may, feeling like you can talk, you are alert, you are basically it's just similar to what you get if you get a good bolus of caffeine or, or, or other stimulants where you feel activated and willing to discuss ideas. Or, and, and sometimes you may even have grandiose ideas and feeling uh, like you can do a lot more than you are able to. But then right. towards the end, Again, that's where the resemblance is to amphetamine, you know, this descending cycle, where people are okay. feeling low, lethargic, they may feel uh, depressed, they may have, um, uh, they may later on have a uh, struggle getting to sleep, and they have also decreased appetite. So for those of you who are familiar with amphetamine, you can think of this as a very low dose of that. Okay, so uh, when we pursued this uh, project uh, years ago, we were alarmed by the data that we had about the prevalence, the increased prevalence in some of these countries of cuts, especially among women and children. We thought that would be important then to define what it, this substance does. And this is just a list of things that we were suspecting may be affected by cut. So those are potential consequences. I should say, by the way, a lot of the time, as you know, uh, many of these effects tend to be more pronounced in vulnerable people. Vulnerable, in this case, vulnerability defined as whether you've had a condition before or whether you have other factors, other risk factors. Then on the top of that, when you add um, when you add anything for that matter, substance uh, or stressors or other things, you really basically tip the scale toward having um, having a problem, have a, a clinical issue. And this is a list of some categories of those clinical issues. So I was just keep skipping one of his. Uh, so what is the KRP? Well, the, basically the program was to advance knowledge on the short and long-term effects of CART use and help guide effort to reduce CART and related mental health problems. Mental health problems is one of the big things that was kind of calling for attention for us. And uh, we thought because of the amount, the, the significance of those problems that started to ensue at the time uh, and to show up on, on the radar screen of people who are interested in global public health, that would be a good idea to assemble some reasonable data to kind of uh, build a baseline for people to work on. So we established a multidisciplinary project, included many universities from US, Europe, uh, Africa, and other countries. The focus was on, on neurobehavioral and mental health effects. And the program as we've evolved, as, as it has evolved, has been a model for how with little money you can really uh, bring about stakeholders from so many institutions, academic and health and uh, service institutions, and catalyze really the a success toward developing a good bolus of knowledge that can be used then to build on. And so when we started, it was really kind of, the, the literature was very meager or people really didn't know much. And as we finished the decade and moved on to do other things, we realized we, when we took stock of what we've done that there was a great deal of work that's been done. Anyway, uh, so uh, we used multiple disciplines, integrated them, integrated methods. We paid attention, informed by clinical observations, to this issue of co use, comorbidity, as you know, in substance use, not only polysubstance use, but also other issues 
that contribute to maintenance of substance use and relapse, but also influenced by substance use. We paid attention to that in that co- in that context, and we were keen because this work was done in low income, low and middle income countries. We were keen at developing capacity and conducting various research training and exp- and giving people opportunities to learn about how to conduct this this uh, research. So this is just to say that the initial initiative was done in um, in East Africa and the uh, Yemen, and then we expanded that to other countries, including to our here, our, uh, our neck of the wood in Minnesota. It's just a very a, a summary of what we did, the four court, uh, uh, things that we focused, the research, which is generating knowledge, and there are the universities that participated in that, the dissemination, which was organizing events, symposia, conferences, uh, publishing in paper, uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals, doing all that, all that dissemination type activities. Um, as you can see from the numbers, considering how long and how much money we had, it was really quite an impressive thing, because people were just so ex- excited, enthusiastic, and interested to do this work, and felt there was value to it. Hence, their interest in putting a lot of time and effort into generating this much knowledge and influence in, and 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 I guess, I guess making the message penetrate m- multiple. Uh, areas, policies, as well as clinical and other other areas of um, of work. Uh, we also contributed toward developing resources in those places where we did this work, and trained the cadre of investigators and young scientists and clinicians in those countries to learn how to do research, but also to appreciate and to. Uh, start to be informed as they manage conditions and patients with situations related to cat and cat related disorders. So I think I'm going to skip this. Skip this. This is more just about. Okay, maybe I give you just a glimpse now, examples of some of the studies we have done. And one of those studies I wanted to highlight was done here in our neck of the wood in in in, uh, in Minnesota. And because cat is illegal and because we are dealing with vulnerable populations immigrants and immigrants and refugees with burden of all sort of you know trauma and, and uh, PTSD and other issues so they're, they're, and also just the concern about 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 the legality of it we did not we were careful when we did this study I, we did this uh, years ago in collaboration with Cook County, with the Cook Clinic and other outlets in the metro, uh, we were careful to not put people on the spot to ask, not to ask sensitive questions. But anyway, the purpose for this very preliminary study was to to examine uh, the linkage between substance use and and other and other substance issues and with cut. Uh, and we did this primarily among East African communities. Uh, did a convenient sampling at about 261 that completed the face-to-face interview during which demographic information and substance use were assessed. I go back to how we, when we were careful, we did not probe much about if you are using CART today, a lot, how much, et cetera, where you get it, et cetera. Uh, because of of just not putting them on any in any vulnerable place. However, we did ask them about have you ever used God, and that's a little bit safer of a question because they can always say, oh, "Well, I did that before I landed here, before I came or something." So we 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 emphasized in our assessment the issue of history of use, and this is just to give you a sense of this uh, this convenient sample. So there are limitations to the methodology we use. Uh, we found that a lot of the people that we interviewed had had history of cut use. Now, even 6.6% were brave to say that they were even using it currently, um, which we did not necessarily ask, but they volunteered that was in the context of an open-ended question. So, but then what you see is the co-use of other things, including tobacco, 
alcohol and other other substances and other illicit drugs. Um, so that was the drive message is that by knowing a little bit about this, we were able to know about their use of other uh, substances. And this is the question we use, have you ever used cut? Now, it is very likely that most of the, or a lot of them are still using uh, cut is available. And, uh, but this is kind of, you can think of it as a surrogate or a proxy question that possibly may tap into current use. But nevertheless, this is what we asked lit verbally, uh, literally, have you ever used? And the yes, as you can see in that darker bars, showing greater report of all others uh, of, of all other substances that we we asked about and and this is the oh I don't see this okay and this is about the current have you ever currently used and the same thing happened however the sample here was much smaller so I think people were hesitant for good reason we did not emphasize this question as much. So we only saw like 17 saying yes, a tiny sample to draw, draw any conclusions. Okay, so a uh, history of cat use is useful in identifying individuals who are vulnerable to substance use related problems. That is the driving point from that set of analysis. Now we have done also studies, a lot of studies, I don't, I'm not going to go to many of those, but in this case, for example, this study we did in, in rural Ethiopia and with pregnant women, and the take home message was that we found that people who were pregnant and knew that they were pregnant, really under, they were using heart because they were minimizing its potential effects. The reality of it is that we don't know much about how, how that is a problem or not a problem. But, to, to, but relatively speaking, users were minimizing the potential health risk associated with cut use than non-users. As let's see this. Uh, and when we think about, uh, you know, the level of dependence in another, so that's another study actually, we looked at how, whether we have a true dependence on cut. That was, that was and is still a debatable question. People say, well, because you are only using, it's a light amphetamine-like substance, you don't have the true bolus effect. You know, for those of you who may have heard me before or you know about this bolus effect, it's a critical element of addiction liability. If you don't see a bolus effect, it's very likely you're seeing something else, maybe habitual, but not necessarily the physical dependence. And with cut, you don't have that bolus effect. However, even with that, that habitual element, the psychological dependence, seemed to produce constellation of symptoms that resemble very much dependence. And in this in this study, we found in this this is a separate study, we found indeed there were signs of dependence that are clear and that are influenced, however, by the chronicity, how long you've been doing. So with an older age, you get that more, that dependence, especially in females. In males, you get a noticeable a signal uh, across, across age. And it's possible because of the cultural practices of how women use cut versus men. Uh, we've had issues, uh, studies where we examined sleep and we found indeed cut users and co-users of cut and other stimulants like tobacco do have poor sleep uh, quality and uh, compared with non-users. Uh, we found that they also have a host of other disrupted physiological and, and emotional response when it comes to acute challenges. The interesting part about this is that we always found that this happened when you have multiple substances. So, CAT by itself does not always show as robust in terms of its Im impact in disrupting the, 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 the stress response or dysregulating how people emotionally react to acute situations. It's the combination of things. If they use CAT with tobacco, if they use CAT with 
other stimulants that they use to cut with alcohol, with other even even caffeine caffeinated high caffeinated stimulants, you start seeing some of the symptomology that looks a, a bit more negative or, or adverse. Uh, that's kind of a similar thing, but uh, without going into this, we also found sig a significant impact on certain. Oh, this is the hormonal processes. Um, what was interesting about this result is when we compared studies that we have done here in Minnesota and others have done with other substances, with what we saw with cod and co-users of cod and tobacco and other substances, we find that the signal of this, this the, the manner of blunting of the stress response or the manner of dysregulation that we see here with these other substances is similar to what we saw with with cut use and co use, except that that dysregulation or the abnormalities are not as severe, but qualitatively similar, quantitatively maybe different. Okay, uh, this is just another way of we did laboratory stress. We did also monitoring to look at the morning cortisol response, etc. I think that so this is the negative aspect. We find that people who who are who are cut users and co-users, they react more negatively to acute circumscribed specific tasks that we provide in the lab in a superficial environment, nevertheless. And they also show greater irritability, greater anger, and uh, other intensity of reactivity to those stressors. Okay, this is just the same. And we found this cognitive functions, deterioration, especially in working memory and attention processes in the co-use. Pay attention to this co-use. It's always a good idea to kind of take the whole approach of what is a person doing, not just what singular things that they are using, but how many other things that they are also using. Even if they look or sound like they are innocuous, a combination of less harmful things, but or a, a combination of minor uh, harm can produce synergism, a synergistic effect where you have then uh, not just the additive harm, but maybe even more than additive harmful effects. And that's what we found even on cognitive functions with co-use. Okay, uh, and this is a, an opportunity study that one of our students did uh, related to fasting during Ramadan in some of the countries where we did the study. And they found that blunted blood pressure response, but this was independent of fasting. So fasting did not alter the manner by which cat use chronically alter the, the, the way our body responds to stress. This is uh, related to PTSD. This is the other thing is, in among patients with PTSD, we found a lot of self uh, uh, self medication type uh, uh, behaviors using cut, uh, using uh, other substances, using um, benzos, for example, and alcohol. And but cut is very high on the list of 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 the of the things that people resort to to try to cope with the PTSD related symptoms. Uh, is CAD added, uh, additive? This is kind of a driving uh, point here. Yes, it is it is habit forming, uh, especially when you use it frequently. And when you use it for extended period of time, and I should have added also when you use, the, when you use a lot of it. So there's physical and psychological symptoms that indicate dependence. So this is the, some of the things we have done before. And in addition to that, to that, you have the time and money spent. You have people using it even if they were tell, told not to because of health adverse effects. And you, of course, have this disruption of function criteria being there because you really spend quite a bit of time chewing at the cost of other things, productive things that you could be doing. There are indications of tolerance and withdrawal also, although the tolerance part is a little bit less investigated. The withdrawal, we did that in our study and we do see withdrawal symptoms. Uh, some of those withdrawal symptoms are here, irritability, insomnia, loss of appetite, lethargy, depression, kind of similar to what you see in the after hour after acute episode. Uh, implication for treatment, there is no research for specific CAT treatment, but relying on anecdotal observations and what 
how patients get taken care of, usually removing them from the environment when they use cut, which is would be like a detox period, helps uh, address that initial craving. Uh, they they can be in full or partial uh, inpatient clinics. Uh, there are some clinics overseas that have done that. Uh, and the, the good part about that is that, especially if it's removed from community or environment, what they are using, is that it does help them rest- to, you know, have attain recovery. The challenge, however, as you well know, once they go back to that community, it's very tough to sustain that recovery. So, and uh, the therapeutic techniques that usually are used in those clinics, and they haven't really done any systematic or collection of data, but they say it works, and they use the, the standard recovery program type with uh, rehab, say, you know, psychological treatment, counseling, and social uh, support groups and, and uh, other alternative activities. Uh, okay, so multiple observations suggest that, suggest a, a, a noticeable effect of CAD. The effects seem to be pronounced in the presence of other comorbid conditions like addictive and mental health conditions. History of current use, current use of CAD should be History or current use of CAD should be carefully, carefully considered in certain groups. So not everybody, in certain groups. Some people may be offended when you ask them a question, but nevertheless, your role as a clinician would be to ask the question. Treat things as a matter of fact. You're taking care of them. So it's enough to know about whether they are using or have ever used when diagnosing and treating patients with other health conditions. I said other health conditions could be, you could also be selective about what type of conditions where you really have to establish differentials that are really tricky to you to, to do, especially in groups that uh, with symptom presentation that you are not familiar with. Okay, I think I will stop here and entertain any questions, do my enough. Oh, there's questions. Um, well, we'll start with Yolanda. She said, I I was taught that cathinone in cot degrades so quickly it doesn't ship well. What are the current residents in the U.S., where are they obtaining it? Is it grown here now, or are, is that being shipped in? I have no idea about growing, although you hear from time to time people found plants. And they are cut, but people don't recognize that it is. Once they try it, it's the same. Uh, they, they have been doing a lot of... Uh, I think dry, especially because now it's le- illegal in in Europe. It used to be until recently legal in countries like in the Netherlands and, and the UK. So it used to have in those markets you used to get access to fresh uh, cod, and not anymore. Or maybe there might be, but uh, obviously it's smuggled illegally. I think in the U.S., I haven't heard, although I don't know uh, much about the uh, the pattern of use because it's not it's underground. So, uh, but I think it's more dried for the most part. But I wouldn't there, be surprised if you have fresh cut around here. There was another question in the chat: um, Is mat, hopefully, or mate used in South America similar to cut? Spelled M A T T E. I I've never heard of that. Is that something you're aware of? Not at all. And in fact, I, I'm going to Google it, Matt. M A T T E. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. No, I don't know. If if you know if you know of any literature on that, please fill, please share. Would love to hear to see that. Yeah, I've not. Uh, I've not heard of that. You know what? Is there a reason? I mean, is this just used as is it a culturally used drug that's considered okay to use or even in the communities that use it is it kind of considered a problem well it it, initially way back when it used to be a cultural part of cultural practice and it's when you think about how in the past they use it they used to use it uh in the afternoon when after lunch when people would get, you know, lethargic and tired and they need to get out to the farm, they need to get out and go out to, to work. And so they would use this as kind of like a, a truck driver using Red Bull or something to just get you, to keep you awake so that, and activated to get to work. That was the traditional use 
long time ago. As you know, one see transfer or transit from traditional use to recreational use, you get in trouble. So now people in recent decades, people using it to have fun for recreation, not necessarily to serve a function. And therefore you, you start having this, this problem. Um, I would say, uh, uh, I was in Kenya recently and, and the discussion is always heated. There are people who think there is no problem with cards or Mira, they call it there. There are problems. With, there are people who say, no, it's not too good. It's a drug. We should be, we should, uh, de- de- we should criminalize it or or uh, remove it or schedule it. Uh, so the controversy does exist, but there is enough tolerance or enough cover among the populace to keep this legal in these countries. Maybe based drawn from the history and the cultural cultural practices. There is another chat that just came in that says there's cocoa tea in Peru used by the natives. It can turn a drug test positive and it can help with altitude sickness. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying earlier. So this is this is kind of a tra- another traditional use. You use this to get you going, to get you to cope with the harsh environment and to work. And it only gets you in trouble once you remo- take that to the lab and make a cocaine out of it and start selling it for people to get fixed then gets in, you get in trouble with this so yeah this is a, a, an excellent analogy mm. but you had another question um i'm just reading in the chat um cody put in maybe the earlier question was in reference to maca that i don't know what that is either so <laughs> yeah you can get maca many places even in stores and so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not enough familiar with any research on that or what, what it does exactly. Uh, I know it's primarily present in Lima and Peru. Peru. Uh, and it's kind of like a, one of those uh, herbs or the people think of it as an herb like ginseng or something. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we have a fairly large East African population in St. Cloud. And I, although I've seen a fair amount of opioid issues and fentanyl issues, I, I've never personally had somebody come in and even mention COT. Um, and and I suspect that's probably something I need to be asking about. Never really never really thought about it. I, I actually had a student who was East African. And she said it's extremely common um, in her you know, even in her family and extended family, in the more often she felt in the men. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I think it is it is actually common, especially among again immigrant communities. Uh, uh, and 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 it, it, it might not be, uh, you know, an, an issue that has to be like oh, you have to be concerned about in a significant way. But when you're seeing patients in clinic. For multiple things, it's a good idea to have to have to have that information, especially when they are presenting presenting with acute situation. It is really important not only for differentiating in terms of diagnosis, but also for how you manage help them manage their symptom their their condition, and especially with psychological problems, acute psychotic disorders, for example, uh, is is one of those issues where if you if you chew a lot for many hours and you don't lose sleep and you have vulnerability already, you've already had a first episode some b- before, uh, then that may actually tip you to get a relapse. But it's going to be the manner by which you go about uh, managing that is going to be completely different than if you are, don't know, or not aware of the cut. In fact, the, ma- the, the management is much easier once you know that they have used cuts. Just have them rest, eat, and drink, and sleep, and uh, the spontaneous reco- uh, recovery or remission would happen automatically. Hmm. Do you know, does COT show up as an amphetamine in the urine? Yeah, I, actually, uh, uh, a lot of our investigators who were doing the work in-country, they were using, and, and that's not always accepted by the scientific community, but they were using 
the regular drug uh, the panels for uh, urine tests and uh, people who use uh, enough cot, they will it will show up as a positive on the amphetamine panel. Hmm. Thank you. That is interesting. Anybody with any other questions that they want to chat in or unmute? So there's somebody that's adding a comment. Very helpful to add that. She says, and that's David Rosemiller. Rosemiller. Yarba mate is really strong tea made in Argentina and Brazil. Lots of caffeine, but nothing else psychoactive that I know of. So, yeah, the, the psychoactive content there would be caffeine, yeah. And lots the, of it can get you going. <laughs> the, the interesting thing, though, is there's a whole culture around it. <clears throat> if you go there, they have, like, elaborate gourds they make, and they, they make the tea in it, and then you actually drink it through a filtered straw. Uh-huh. So uh -huh. So it's, it's similar in the cultural context. It's, yeah. it's cut and... and, and uh, Kratom and further east in Asia. Yeah, you mentioned Kratom. That's another another good analogy. A good analogy. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We see quite a bit of that. The, the Kratom, it's everywhere. One of the other questions that I had, and you brought it up in a slide, that dental and GI issues can go along with this, as well as cancer. Is the cancer localized to the mouth, throat, and the GI system, or is it systemic? Well, that's actually where the observations have been, more of single case uh, studies uh, or, or case control studies. Also, I think I'm aware of a couple of those, uh, the oral and some GI. Um, and the confounds, as you know, is among CART users, uh, both outside, but even in the U.S., I assume a lot of smoking happens. Actually, our data do show that. And once you have that as being another another behavior, then you just don't know which is what. A very we we had hard time uh, finding cut only users in our earlier studies. Wow. Well, the, I, yeah. The, the, there is a, a comment here, and that reminds me of reminded me of something. So it says other, this is from Elizabeth Builder. Yep. Uh, I'm from the toxicologist from Duluth. Yeah. Other cathinones, example, propion. Propion is not cathinones, is it? It's wellbutrin. Yeah, it's wellbutrin. So may sometimes show up as false positive amphetamine. Um, yeah, and Adderall, among others, and other other anti uh, ADHD medications and other stimulants medications. We we struggle with those things in our studies here when we had to dismiss people if they show positive and they swear that they are not using drug but they are taking medication that's prescribed and fully um, uh, and legitimate. Uh, but that reminds me about caffeine. So you may have heard about caffeine in the context of. So synthetics, like bath salts and other cathinones, are very dangerous, uh, and, and that can can kill you. It's, I mean, and sometimes that shows up in a in a clubbings in the club in the in the club scenes. I guess I don't know how to describe that, and that is very different. Yes, the commonality between that and cod is the fact that caffeine is present in cod, but the way these things get you know, get mixed and manipulated as a, uh, you don't know what you're getting. But those are the, some of the dangerous things that sometimes uh, they come in waves, uh, but they are here. All right. Any other questions that anybody else has? I think I've gone through all of mine. I, I have as well. Yeah, I can't can't uh, say how much we appreciate this. This was This was an area we have not been in in six years of doing this. Uh, we've never had anybody come talk about COT, and it's certainly something that's around. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on today and kind of sharing your knowledge. Uh, really, Thank wonderful. you, and I, I appreciate talking to you again. I don't know if you recall during COVID that came and presented on COVID and trauma yeah. and stress. That's the other, that's my hat. The one I'm wearing is about the stress and 
Uh, <laughs> but uh, glad to be with you again. And uh, again, if anybody has any questions, interest in collaborating or interest in or, or questions about anything we're doing, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, hopefully, Katie can provide the email and uh, be happy to share any information you need. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder, Katie did share the link to register onto the new platform. So click that bugger and get yourself registered. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a good week. Thank you, Al Albasi. Thank you so much. Thank you.